It's always a joy for me to come here to the Federated Church. Can everybody hear me okay? Sound-wise, okay. And I come here today in following in line with this series of messages with a recollection as to how important this passage is to me today. And I trust that I can convey that to you. But this, when we talk about the persecution of the church, it started back when I was here as an assistant pastor. And someone brought me a book to read. The name of the book was Tortured for Christ. And the author of the book was Richard Wormbrand. Richard Wormbrand, in his book, talked about his 14 years in communist prison. And he passionately started a ministry that we as, particularly in the American church, ought not to forget those who are persecuted around the world. It's interesting to me that that, that burden that started with that book and me reading it and the Holy Spirit just talking to me about this issue, uh, it, it, it's began to burden my heart for those that are in this situation around the world. Richard Wormbrand would track those Christians who he had heard of through various sources that came to him of their various persecutions. In those days, it was communism that persecuted many Christians. And, uh, of course, now we know that it's gone beyond communism. And uh, Islam and jihadists are brutal in their persecution of Christians. But I, I need to tell you this because there was one drawback that I had in, in reading month after month these Stories. The, these people that I would read about became my heroes. You know, we think about heroes of the faith, you know, uh, high caliber pastors and, uh, you know, with all that behind their name. But these obscure Christians, many of them who are hacked to death without anyone hardly knowing or knowing about it, became my heroes. But what, what happened in me was that I would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat. Can you wonder why? I don't know if any of you have experienced this. And I want to put a little moment in here to, just to say to you, my purpose here today is not to scare you to death. You know. But there is, there is something to be said about us hearing of the brutality that man can place upon other men and women, uh, lately of which, if you have read it all, about the October massacre in Israel of what, approximately 1,400 Jewish people brutally, savagely, Cut up. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even want to say. And, and I, did, I could not, listen, I could have gone online. Maybe some of you did. I can't watch that stuff. I just hear it, and it just grips me. But the one that, that kept me up a lot at night was hearing of uh, African Christians who were standing for their faith and there were two Christians in particular who the communists there in, in Africa, I won't mention which country, but 
they decided that they were trying to get these two to recant. And we're going to talk about this a little bit in a moment. But uh, they refused to. They refused to give up their faith. They refused to deny their faith. And so they took them out into the African bush country. And they found these large anthills. Have you, have you seen some of those? The ants will build these huge anthills, mounds. They took them to near one of these anthills. And they dug holes and buried them with only their head showing. Buried, tied their arms behind, beside themselves and buried their, up to the neck. And then they kicked over the anthills. And he talked about these Christians dying with ants consuming their body up their nose, up their ears. I mean, and and I I read that, and I thought, that's the cruelest thing I could ever think of. But then I thought, you know, that's only what I could think of. Isn't it amazing what men can come up with to torture other people? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought about what what could possess a person? to do torturous things, particularly to good people. But we have the information today, don't we, that we read a little bit of the scriptures. And so I would, I would wake up in a cold sweat, and I would feel to myself, what if that was me? Could I stand to the very last moment and not deny or turn away from Christ. Joseph Tsan was also a Romanian pastor. He told his story, and his story was, I stood before a communist firing squad. He had been interrogated for months. Joseph was a pastor who had was well known at that time in Romania. The interrogators tried to get him to deny his faith. One of the interrogators was called the butcher. Could you imagine standing in front of a man called the butcher? And they, they would do everything they could to get this pastor to recant. And he said, I cannot. And so they said, well, we, you know, we will kill you. And he says, good. <laughs> Go ahead. And one day, there were four interrogators that would stand before him, and they were interrogated often. And three of the interrogators had to go use the bathroom. And he was left with the butcher face to face. And the butcher said to this pastor, I have never met anybody like you. I have interrogated thousands. And he says, I, ha I see no fear of death in you whatsoever. All these others, I can see it in their eyes. There's one thing that they're afraid of, and that is dying. And he says, but you stand like a rock. Well, he says, I'm going to heaven. And he said, if, they said, he said, if you execute me, I'm going to get there a little earlier than I thought I was. But I'm going to heaven and you'll do me nothing but a favor. But secondly, he says, my sermons are all over Romania. I've taped them. I've written booklets. There's been all kinds of writings about my sermons and teachings on the Bible. And he says, when my blood is splattered on my manuscripts, it'll be more meaningful than I could ever make them myself. Well, they stood back. Now, this is in front of a firing squad. They stood back, and they began to confer with each other. And they said, he's right. <laughs> he's right. If we 
kill him. We'll make a martyr out of him. And this Christianity will spread even faster. So, I mean, in that condition, they dropped their guns and they exiled him to the United States, which was probably his worst punishment. So those are, are some of the thoughts that come to my mind today. There's a, a verse in Matthew. Do we have that, bro? On uh, Matthew 10, 16, before I get into the text. This verse, I want you to look at it. It says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now Jesus said this when he was sending the twelve out on evangelistic outreach. So he tells them they're going to go out, they're going to take no script with them, and they're going to go house to house and all those things. Some of you are familiar with that. But he says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. But later on, he sent 70 out. Do you remember? He not only sent 12 out, but later he sent another group called the 70. He commissioned them, and he told them, the very same thing. I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now I want to ask you a question. What chance does sheep or a lamb have in a pack of wolves? Very little. Very little chance of survival. And Jesus is telling his disciples... I'm sending you out in the midst of wolves. They should have said, what? Why? Why are you putting me in a position to be eaten alive? And yet Jesus said, go, and I will be with you. And that's one of the things I hope we can remember to get to is his spirit. He said, my spirit will be with you. You remember he said, when you stand before kings or whatever, do not try to think about everything you're going to say and how you're going to defend yourself, but the Spirit of God will tell you what to say in the moment that you need it. And some of the most profound words of faith come from people who are ready to be eaten by wolves. And so... Here today, I want to come to you and say, I don't think that persecution in America is too far away. In the Article 3 of the Constitution of the United States, says this. This was a penned in September 25th, 1789. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Built in to this country that we live in and all of us have enjoyed is the establishment clause of religion. We, we as Americans have been given, and we're going to say it that way, the right. This is our right. And if somebody going to persecute us in America, they're going to have to pay for it. Have you ever thought for a moment that in the New Testament it did not dress freedom of religion? America established it. Our forefathers, why did they come over here? Freedom of religion and persecution? They came over here to establish a country, a nation, that would protect us from this. 
And beloved, we have lived under this wonderful protection. It's awesome. But how many of you have sensed with me the erosion that is taking place week by week, month by month? And there are all kinds of issues that are surrounding this because, you know, there's people that don't like what's happening right here in this building. Do you know that? And they want to stop us, stop our mouth. I want you to see this next one. I think this is the one on uh, next article. 300... And 65 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution for their faith. This is around the world. I want you to see 365 million. What is the population of the United States? Is it about this? I think it is. But uh, as many people as live in, in America, living outside of America, are suffering persecution, high levels, high levels of persecution for their faith, or, to say it this way, one in seven Christians are persecuted because of their faith during last year, 2023. One in seven Christians. Some of you might say, I don't hear that. You want to know why we don't hear it? We're here in America. And a lot of these things just don't make it out to the main press. 4,998 Christians were murdered for practicing their faith, counting only the number reported. This source was from uh, World Watch List. Tell us about these uh, uh, part of Open Doors. In the United States, some 15,000 churches or public Christian properties were attacked. Now we don't hear about this a lot, do you? Have you have we heard about churches being burned in our country? There's a lot of this that's going on. That's an, an increase of seven times over 2022. Now, because freedom is not addressed in our scriptures that Jesus never guaranteed our freedom of religion. That's why I said I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. There's no guarantee. We have that as the United States. But Jesus did tell us that we have freedom. And that freedom is expressed when thousands of Christians are persecuted, put in prison, or threatened, or whatever it is, that they'll stand strong for the things of God. So let's take a moment, if we could now, to go to our Bible in John chapter 15, please. In John chapter 15, Jesus talks about The vine and the branches, and you've had those messages brought to you. I've listened to some of them online. Great, great messages. It's great. But we're down here to verse 18 of the words of Jesus. And I want to break this down a little bit this morning. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We're going to stop there for a minute, and there are two words that I want to pull out of there. The first word is the word hatred. The word hatred. The, the word hatred comes from a, a Greek word called misio. Almost sounds like misery, doesn't it? Misio. And it means this malicious and un, 
justifiable feelings toward others. So, hatred is something for us, uh, difficult for us to wrap our hands around, wrap our mind around. Because for us who, are, who believe, hatred is not to be a way of life, is it? Hatred is the opposite. We are to love. And we are to love sacrificially as Jesus taught us to love. And yet, this whole idea of hatred comes about in this manner. In 1 John 3.15, I'll just read, Whoever hates me, John wrote, is a murderer. In his letter, he wrote, Whoever hates me is a murderer. So, hatred involves murder. When there are murders, uh, well, I, I wasn't planning on this, but my wife Judy's here today, right up front here, and she likes to watch 2020 <laughs> and all these murder things, you know. And sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, it's still going on, the idea <laughs> So-and-so killed so-and-so and murdered so-and-so. And it all wraps around hatred. Somebody hates somebody else. Somebody got in somebody's way. Somebody had an affair with somebody. Somebody stole the money or whatever it is. And, and so there's people killing each other all the time. Hatred is, mur hatred is murder. Now... Look with me quickly. We're, we're going to come back here to this, to this passage. But uh, in John chapter 8, let's just go back a little bit, a couple chapters. In John chapter 8, and we're going to find out why, why the world hates us. He says in verse 44, John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil. He's speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So you want to know, why does the world hate us? Because of daddy devil. It's, the, it's the, the devil who puts into the hearts of people hatred toward others. So I want to say this carefully, slowly, but if you haven't figured out, this is very simple. The devil hates you. He hates you worse than you could ever imagine. I, I've asked myself, if the devil hates me so much, how do I survive? How do I make it through from one day to another? Because God puts a hedge about us. Amen? We find that this was true of Job. And Satan says, well, you know, Job there, you just, you just put a hedge about him. You just keep protecting him. And God says, you bet I am. He's my servant. So I want you to know that even though we have this backdrop of persecution, God places hedges about us, and the devil has to go through him if he's going to get to us. And if that comes, uh, some form of persecution, God has a plan and a purpose. Can I hear an amen, somebody? This is where we need to trust God. He's sovereign and he's Lord. Now, the next word back here in John 15 is if the world hates you. So we need to identify the source of this, where, where this is coming from. And Jesus said it's the world. Hey, I want you to know being in the church is a wonderful thing. I, I love the fact that when we as believers gather together, there is 
great camaraderie amongst us to love each other and to care for each other. This is the church at work. And the world looks in, into this and says, I hate that. Have you ever met people who say, if you're happy, that makes them miserable? You know? Yeah, I'm miserable because you're happy. But what is the world? How do I identify this? The, the Greek word for the world that mentioned here, that Jesus mentions, is called this word called cosmos. Um, it, it's, it's a word that means this. It's defined best as the worldly system. Now, the worldly system, listen, we're going to look at this in a moment, but the worldly system is controlled by Satan. So there we go again. Satan is it. Now, the worldly system is, is, I like to look at it as like a web. And, you know, I'll, we'll, we'll hear Christians telling new Christians, don't get back into the world right now. You need to get settled in. We find here that Jesus said, I have called you, look at here, out of the world, right? The worldly system. So before we're saved, we're caught in, I like to see it as a web. The web of deceit is Satan's master plan that everything that you look at, everything that you touch, is infected by him. How do we know this? We know this from 1 John chapter 2. Let's go back to that. If you look in your Bible real quick, 1 John chapter 2. This is a very important verse for you to memorize, to know, to hold. This is a powerful explanation of what we deal with. Jesus, or John wrote in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, the world, the cosmos, the worldly system, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world or the worldly system. And the worldly system passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. So, God calls us out of this worldly system, calls us into the church. Here in the church is where you find love. Loving these, this beautiful family up here. Just part, and, you, and you, you take them in, and you embrace them, and that that we are part of each other, we care for each other, we love each other. This is the church. The worldly system does not know this. There, it's a built-in trap of Satan, and that because of it, Satan comes. Satan will come either directly to you, or he'll come around the back door. I've, I wrote this out. Persecution takes many forms, from insults and abuse to discrimination in education and the workplace, to outright violence. We might characterize these different forms as smash and squeeze. The smash represents overt violence against Christians simply because of their faith. This could include bombings, arson, shooting, rapes, kidnapping, forcible evictions. But then there's the squeeze, which represents the suffocating restrictions faced by many Christians in daily life. Red tape and legal restrictions and inability to publicly display your faith and discrimination woven into the fabric of society. Smash is physical, visible, and violent. Squeeze is insidious, structural, and suffocating. Both have the same aim the erasure of Christianity in their country, region, tribe, or family. We're doing it for time. 
I had the privilege of going to Bulgaria. I went four times. I went the first time in 1999. And if some of you know, Bulgaria was in the, is in the Slavic regions. And those were all under communism. And I went in 1999. Communism, does anybody remember when communism collapsed in Europe? 1989. So when I was there visiting... We were establishing a rela- our church was establishing a, a sister relationship with another church, and uh, when I when I was there, was, they were just ten years removed from persecution. And to every church that we went, we encountered people who had been in prison for their faith. And I'll never forget this one pastor. He stood up and he said. I've got to tell you what happened in my church. He says, I was thrown into prison and they sent in a communist pastor or a sympathetic pastor to communism. He came into the church. Probably, I, I was in the church, so it had a similar stage as this, a little more narrow and a little older. But he said that the pastor came into the building, and all the women of the church, all the men of the church had been put in prison. Every last man of the church was put in prison. When the communist pastor came in, the women of the church rushed to the platform. And they gathered together, and they locked their arms. I love this. And they looked at this man, and they said, not in our church. This was the women They took a stand that day for their faith. And they threatened them and told them, you get out of here. And So for the whole service, they stood on the stage, sang their worship songs, and praised the Lord together. (laughs) I thought, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's awesome. What a wonderful way to go, to stand for your faith in Christ. Uh, His name was Christo Kulichev was the pastor who was thrown in jail. Uh, a great, a great story. Well, I gotta, I gotta move on. Uh, the a pastor said this. Uh, his name was Dimitar. While incarcerated in communist prison, we saw God perform miracles of many kinds. Many believers would become sick through poor conditions, and we would pray. And we saw miraculous healings that were not witnessed before prison or after we had gone out. Richard Wormbrand, who I told you about, Tortured for Christ, he wrote this, Hate the evil systems, but love your persecutors. Love their souls and try to win them for Christ. Just a few minutes before I get to my last one here. Uh, This group now over in in Israel called Hamas. Do Do you know that they are teaching their children to kill? I wrote this. Children of Hamas are taught to hate the Jews and to kill every one of them because the Jews have no right to the land of Israel they say. Palestinian media watch expert Ithmar Marcos has been warning the Israeli government for years about how the Palestinians teach their children that it is their duty to murder. Israelis, uh, uh, Israelis and sac- uh, excuse me, murder Israelis and sacrifice for the cause of Palestine. It is their obligation to kill themselves while killing Israelis to become holy martyrs called Shadids. In our own hemisphere in Nicaragua, the communist Nicaraguan regime under President Daniel Ortega has expanded its persecution of Christians. This is just recently by imposing 
11 evangelical, imprisoning 11 evangelical pastors, as well as dozens of Catholic priests, jailed while over the last five years. 97 priests have been forced to leave their country. Well, I could go on and on, but uh, persecution is a part of our experience as Christians. And uh, there was nothing quite as riveting recently that I read until this one. And uh, I don't usually read like this, but I need to read this to you. And then we'll begin to wrap this up. Pastor John, his name is, he's somewhere in the Middle East. His whereabouts is not specifically known in this article. Pastor John was standing behind the pulpit of his small church in the Middle East on Sunday morning, December 2nd, 2012, when about 20 heavily armed Al-Qaeda fighters stormed through the front door screaming, Jihad! Jihad! The Islamists began pulling the nearly 40 terrified worshipers from their seats, beating them and shoving them to one side of the building. Then the group's leader ordered his men to aim their automatic rifles toward the congregation. He shoved his handgun against a church member's head and threatened to start shooting everyone in the church one at a time. Some of the church member cry, members cried out in terror, and young girls standing near the pastor's wife grabbed her legs in such desperation that they tore her clothes. John said he was about to run toward his congregation when amid the chaos, God gave him a vision of heaven. He writes, I saw heaven open and heard angels singing. He said, compelled by the heavenly vision, he yelled, God is welcoming us. Be at peace. We are all going to heaven. His unexpected response to an imminent threat of death caused a reverent hush to fall over the congregation. All the people stopped crying and readied to meet their Savior. Pastor John explained, they could feel the presence of God. If you read, read the Bible, when Stephen is dying, he is not crying. Though the stones are painful, he saw heaven open. That was happening to us. Sensing the change in atmosphere, the Islamists seemed unsettled by the group of Christians who no longer feared death. This land belongs to Muslims, the Al-Qaeda leader yelled as defensively as he could. He and the other militants then started ransacking the church, taking the sound system, the tables, the chairs, a generator, cell phones, oh my, the minibus, and even some Bibles. Before leaving, the extremists vandalized what remained in the church and warned the congregation that they would kill them if they ever returned to the church building. But the next day, guess what happened? Even more church members arrived to worship God. <laughs> he said, Pastor says, we all came. Another 10 added on to the 40 to 50 people ready to die. Guess what? The Al-Qaeda fighters never did return. <laughs> hey, listen. Only the Holy Spirit can help us to face death under persecution it is the job of the Holy Spirit to do this. And it's interesting for me as I read all of these stories and people who tell about this, that they'll talk about the fear of death seems to lift from them in front of their persecutors. And they, 
they say things of which the Holy Spirit so imprints upon some of these people that they become Christians. I close with this. I just read this just the other day. Have you followed this about this Mulvaney guy, this Russian guy who tried to overthrow Putin? Well, I was surprised to read this. He, he died recently, or they think he was murdered. Did any of you hear that he became a Christian? He became a Christian. He was an avowed atheist. And a couple of years ago, when he returned to Russia, he, of course, was put back in prison and beaten and all kinds of things. But during those beatings, he found his way to Christ and the Bible. And he declared to people before his death that I am a child of God. I'm a born-again Christian. Who would have ever known? And yet, there are stories like this all around the world of Christians that are being persecuted. So I want to ask you as we close today. Are you willing that if God asks of us, any one of us, to make a stand for him that would involve our possible death, could we stand there and take it? I say to myself, it's my heart that I want to. And everything I hear, it's the Holy Spirit only comes when we're at, at, in those persecution moments. The Holy Spirit only comes with his power at the very moment that we need him the most and fills us with God's peace. So I'd like you to bow your head with me, please. We in America, in the American church, have been very comfortable for over 200 years. But it really doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that the persecution of the church, the evangelical church, is near at hand. And we should not be surprised because Jesus told us, do not be surprised if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. Because if they hated me, they'll hate you. And the greatest consolation that we have is our master, the Lord Jesus, who made his way all the way to a cross, beaten, even to the point of death, of course, that there on the cross he paid the price for our sin and for our deliverance and for our joy and for our peace. If today that confidence is not strong within you, then may today be that moment when you say, you know, whenever you talk about stuff like it, it scares me. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I'll, I'll buckle under. I'm afraid that I won't make it. Because the scripture says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. I don't know if I can, if I can do all that. And God says through the word that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So today in this moment, as we recommit ourselves to the Lord Jesus, Lord, give us your courage, give us your strength, give us your power to work mightily in your people here at Federated Church to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.